my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Delaney Easton. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the very best leaders in California, Camille Mabin. <clears throat> there is no finer warrior in this world for the children of California than Camille. And I'm so proud of First Vibe. I will tell you that it, when Camille applied for the job, somebody called me and asked, but is she tough enough? I said, you confuse her optimism with a lack of strength. She will go into a room full of horse manure and say, oh my, there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> but uh, she also can, in fact, work harder than anybody with the best ethics and the best goals. And you are so fortunate to have her as your leader. Camille, thank you very much. <clears throat> I love this state. I was born in San Diego, California. In fact, my dad was stationed there. He always said I, the hospital I was born in wasn't named until my birth, and the doctor took one look at me and said, mercy. <laughs> but in truth, I grew up in the ba San Francisco Bay Area. My mother was a San Franciscan, and, and now I'm privileged to live in Davis, California. But as I've traveled the state, and I went to all 58 counties visiting schools, so no matter where you're from, I've been to your county. The truth be known, I love this state, but I've never been more frightened than I am right now for my state and my nation. The truth is that we are in danger in this country, and uh, we have a new leader for the president-elect. We don't know where he stands on preschool and on the values that are ab about this organization that are taking care of the youngest among us. We don't know yet where he stands, but we do know, in fact, that in the state of California, we managed to pass Prop 55, which was a good thing, but I want to just put this in perspective. As Camille mentioned, I have long said budgets are statements of values. Well, because 55 passed, the state of California will not drop to 50th in per pupil spending. We will remain at 42nd of the 50 states adjusted for the cost of living. Let me just let that sink in, because you're living in the most expensive state in the union. It used to be fifth of the 50 states in per pupil spending, and when it was in the top 10 in investment, it was the top 10 of achievement. Now it's in the bottom 10 in investment and the bottom 10 in achievement. So I'm tired of hearing people slap themselves on the back about what a great job they've done giving the schools all the money back. They haven't given all the money back. They haven't even begun to give the money that the kids deserve, and we aren't, in fact, doing what we need to do for each and every child from birth until they go through grad school. <clears throat> and in our case, our youngest children, of course, are not funded in Prop 98. And what's the case in California is stunning. 25, over 25% 25 of the children in this state are poor. The national figure is 16.7%. And so we have a huge increase in the actual numbers and the percentage of poor kids over the last quarter of a century. And what do we know about education? We know that in fact it really does. Alison Gopnik was brilliant. I couldn't stay the whole day yesterday, but I came in to see her because I love The Scientist in the Crib. It is one of my all-time favorite books. And the truth is we should be having a conversation about universal preschool. In my case, the task force came out in 97 and said we should have done it within 10 years. Well, next year it'll be 20 years. But we should begin on the path. Right now, you can get, it's easier to get child development in preschool in Oklahoma and Georgia. Doesn't that embarrass you? It's a shame on California that we have stepped away. When the Second World War was here, they put child development centers in all 48 states. The truth was there were so many women in the workforce because of the Second World War. Well, guess what? There's a higher percentage of people in the workforce now that are female than there was then. Why don't we have universal preschool? Of course we should have it. Of course we need more child development. Of course we need more for our kids. And I want to read you something from The Economist magazine that says, quote, 
There is evidence that America and Britain, the countries that combine high female employment with reluctance to involve the state in child care, serve their children especially poorly, end quote. One of the little known facts that is that although Prop 56 passed, and I'm very grateful, it does in fact give us some additional resources to backfill the money that we're losing, but at the end of the day, this Prop 10 is a start, Prop 56 is a start, but we need a much more focused attention on child development from birth to age five in the great state of California. <clears throat> My favorite line from the scientist in the crib is the one that is the human baby's computational system is really a network wired together by language and love instead of optic fiber, end quote. So we need to be talking about language and love and children and the future of this state. And we need to understand that the reason that the Silicon Valley is here is because of a confluence of great schools and great education, not the Tigris and Euphrates River, but in fact, something more important and better. And for us to have dropped so much in our investment in schools, and by the way, community colleges tell me that their ECE, their early childhood education departments, have dropped by something like a third we're not investing in the education of the educators to help us with early childhood, as well as not investing in childhood. And preschool is much more important than a sexy high-speed train from Bakersfield to anywhere. <laughs> I'll just tell you that when I was getting ready to go to college, I was, I was uh, accepted at UC Davis, and at that time, girls could not borrow money until they were 21, boys could borrow at 18. They put women in the Civil Rights Act, and that's when that changed. But the truth be known, the budget of my parents was tight. My dad was a machinist, my mother worked in a dress shop. They didn't have a lot of money, and they needed a new car. They had a 10-year-old Studebaker, and they'd stopped making Studebakers five years earlier. My dad really wanted a new car. My mother wanted a new couch. My brother and I had done our trampoline work on the old couch, and there was a spring coming out of it. She was mortified. She was a styler, you know. And, and my parents wanted to go to the family reunion because my dad's mother had recently passed, and she was a rock star, a wonderful woman, had 13 kids. And my dad wanted to go to the reunion, and they wanted to send their daughter to college. Well, guess what? Did they buy a new car? No. Did they buy a new couch? No. Did they go to Kentucky? No. Did they send their daughter to college? You bet your life they did. And so when we look at this, at this state, we have to understand that kids are young, but they're not saps. They've been to the mall. Of course we needed to pass a bond to build new schools, but the fact is it doesn't help us with preschools. So we need more time, focus, and attention on preschools as part of the educational system, absolutely as important as kindergarten and everything else. But kindergarten's not even mandatory in California. Isn't that ridiculous? And <clears throat> at the end of the day, of course, Prop 58 passed, and we're happy about that, but it's an incredible opportunity for us to foster dual language. My niece went to dual language immersion at River Glen in San Jose. She was fluent in Spanish, introduced me in the third grade at the Cabe Conference in Spanish. She went on in high school to learn French. In college, she learned Russian. Now she's taking lessons at the Finnish embassy in Finnish all because she had that great opportunity as a child. So thank God 58 passed. I want all kids in this state to be dual language kids in the future. <clears throat> and I will just say to all of you, the truth, when I went to the preschools in France, and some of you have heard me say this, I was blown away. I went first to see the creche, which is where the little babies are, and then when they were potty trained, they go to L'Ecole Maternelle. I went to L'Ecole Maternelle, the French government actually pays the salaries of the teachers. They're paid what elementary teachers are paid. They have the same level of education. And then, yeah, and then they, uh, the, the building itself is provided by the local community. But it's an eight hour day in school for preschoolers. It's included. If you want to buy wraparound services, you have to pay for them. So if you need to drop your child off early or have your child stay late, that much you have to pay for. Everything else is provided by the French government. I asked the woman who was the number two at the Ministry of Education, and she, by the way, had a son who was a doctor living in Menlo Park, California. 
And she complained to me that California was not doing more for the children. Why, are you, why do you not do this? And I said, well, that's one of the reasons I'm here. I want to learn everything I can from you. I'd especially love it if you could give me some of your research. And she says, <laughs> the French. We do not have some of the great research institutions that you Americans have. We use your research. <laughs> so for us to know what's right and not do what's right is the next thing to criminal that I can think of. The truth is we absolutely need to be on a crusade to make sure that every child from the day it is born has a state that reaches out to a family and makes sure those families are supported in every way possible. <clears throat> And so that means we all have to get together. We have to get together with K-12, and we have to get together with the community colleges, and with CSU, and with UC. You know, if I gave you 20 pencils one at a time, everyone probably in this room could break every pencil. But if I gave you 20 pencils together, the strongest person in this room couldn't break it. We need to make sure education thinks about itself holistically that our job in this world is to worry about those babies from birth through preschool on into graduate school. We have to worry about every single opportunity every day. It's not acceptable for us to be 42nd in per pupil spending, nor is it acceptable that we don't have universal preschool, nor is it acceptable that we don't have child development opportunities for every mom that goes back to work. By the way, there, there's only four countries that don't have paid maternity leave. You know what they are? That would be Papua New Guinea, Swaziland, Liberia, and the United States of America. Shame on us. Stop paying lip service to being pro-child and start putting your money where your mouth is. We're number one in per-prisoner expenditure, by the way, and that's not okay with me. <clears throat> the last thing I'll tell you is I went to, San, to uh, Texas to visit my oldest friend. She's a retired school teacher living with the, his, her brother and his wife, and they're down outside of Austin. And she took me to the LBJ Ranch. And I walked on the ranch, and. We, were, we went to the schoolhouse, the one-room schoolhouse where Lyndon Johnson went to school. And the person who was the tour guide said to us, you know, Lyndon Johnson's mother brought him by the hand here when he was four years old and told the teacher, Lyndon is only four, but I, it would really make a huge difference to me if he could start school at age four. And he can read. And the teacher said, he can read, huh? Show me. She said, well, I didn't bring a book. She says, I've got books. Went over and got a book that Lyndon had never seen. And she put the book in his hands, and he sat down, and he read her what was in the book. And so he, she said, all right, I'll let your child stay here in school. And Lyndon Johnson later reflected that that being able to start school at age four gave him a head start on his education, which is why he started Head Start. That was back in the 60s. Isn't it time for us to go so much further than what we did in the 60s as we enter this next wonderful new millennium? And I know it's easy to get depressed, but we can't get depressed. You know, I always say if you really get down in the mouth, you know, you need to go and look in the eyes of a child. I used to think I saw hope there, but instead I now realize hope is something you do with your fingers crossed. When you look in the eyes of a child, what you see is optimism. And so indeed, we have to have optimism about where we're going and who we are and what we're going to do in the future. And I want to just say that, last but certainly not least, but just as I introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, I just want to take a moment at this time to toast American heroes, California heroes. You know, we forget sometimes <clears throat> that Heroes are really regular people that possess extraordinary skills or great courage or vision or heart in a difficult time. They occasionally look like movie stars, but more often they look like Abe Lincoln or Jane Addams. They look like Harry Truman and Harriet Tubman. They look like Mr. Rogers or Betty White. They look like Rob Reiner or Barbara Jordan or Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta. Look around this room. They look like the people in this room. The true heroes <coughs> we meet on the life's roadway were probably never numerous, but they're in particularly short supply in some of our leadership positions. Look around this room, this is what heroes look like, and I urge you all to help the leaders of our state and our nation to really take us into a future that says yes to its children, says optimistically we are going forward, this state, our nation, on behalf of the future.
And so I'm privileged to introduce somebody who understands that. Sylvia Azevedo is a wonderful award-winning entrepreneur. She's garnered worldwide recognition for her work in addressing one of society's most cha great challenges, universal access to education. Ms. Acevedo actually began her career as a rocket scientist. This is what a rocket scientist looks like. <laughs> and at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, she worked on the Voyager's mission to fly by Jupiter and its moons, and she also worked on the solar polar probe missions. Since then, she served as an executive with several Fortune 100 companies. You might have heard of them. A place called Apple, IBM, Autodesk, and Dell. In 2010, President Obama named Sylvia to the White House Commission for Educational Excellence for Hispanics, for which she serves as chair of the Early Childhood Subcommittee. In 2012, she was named by U.S. News and World Report as one of the top 100 American women in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. She is a founder, president, and CEO of Communicard LLC, where, she, where the focus is communicating with today's multicultural workforce. She's also the interim CEO of the Girl Scouts of the United States. Her remarks today will focus on dual language advantages for this child and the economy. Please give a warm welcome to Sylvia Acevedo. All right, I've given a lot of talks, but following her, tough act to follow. You know,